Up next, we have a very special treat for you. When I learned that 2014 would mark 20 years in the biz for Mongrel Media, I knew immediately that not only would we want to celebrate that at the festival, but we would also want to hear from the founder and CEO himself, Hussein Amarshi, how the company has grown to be the second largest distributor in Canada. Hussein has built the company from the ground up. His unique and important way of mixing astute business acumen with great taste and conviction has resulted in a world-class slate of films each year. This year, Mongrel will release some of the most acclaimed films of the year, such as Winter Sleep, which won the, the Palme d'Or at Cannes, and uh, Richard Linklater's Boy, Boyhood, and Damien Chazelle's Whiplash, which have garnered great Oscar buzz thus far, amongst many, many others. Um, but the distribution landscape is rapidly changing, both in Canada and abroad, and I know Hussein will be humble in talking about his successes today, uh, which are great and many, but is most excited to talk about where things are going in the world of distribution. We're thrilled to, watch, to welcome Marsha Lederman, the Western Arts Correspondent of the Globe and Mail, to host this important one-on-one -on -one conversation with Hussein. A warm welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. And before we get started, let's, talk, let's take a quick walk down memory lane with Mongrel over the past 20 years. Enjoy. Well, that is truly impressive, Thank Hussein. You. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much for, for being here. Now, I have read conflicting reports that um, 20 years ago you began the company in your bedroom. I've also read that you began it in your basement. Now, perhaps your bedroom was in your basement, <laughs> that could um, been, yeah. in which case the reports would not have been conflicting. But tell us about starting Mongrel 20 years ago. It was in the bedroom, um, and I, I say it, it was a bedroom because it's a fairly small apartment I was living in, and I had my desk in my bedroom, and I had a little laptop that I just picked up you know, before the windows came out, and I, I made the mistake I was not reading the trades at the time, so I didn't know that I should not be buying an MS-DOS uh, 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 laptop for 3,000 bucks at the time. Yeah, 1994 Anyways, must have exactly. been heavy. Yeah, it was heavy. It was heavy and, uh, and cumbersome. Anyways, so yeah, so it was out of that, uh, that apartment that I, I, I started the company. And, and, but, the, but, the, but, the, but the thinking about, uh, on, the, on, on setting up the company was probably co comes beforehand uh, in that I, I, I was at university at Queen's in, uh, in 89, from 89 to 93 or something like that. And, and I ended up getting a job at, at, the, at the university at the International Center. And the job was to do international development education, which meant that, you know, to do programming around what was happening in the third world for the, for the Kingston community and the university students to figure out what was happening in the, in the world. And, and one of the ideas that I came up with was to let's start a film festival and bring films from around the world. And so that was uh, my sort of entry into the, into the, into the business and into, into film in particular. And, uh, and it was in doing that festival that I became aware of the fact that it was not that easy to get films that were not in circulation in the U.S. primarily. I mean, the fact is that, uh, you know, uh, I had to go to sales agents in, in Switzerland or in France or wherever it is, and, and this is, these are days before internet, and so, you know, the quick emails and stuff like that. This was like calling them, waking up early to make sure that you, the time, times, time zones were correct, and, and, and making those deals and bringing those, you know, heavy 35 millimeter prints, and they're, they're probably what, 70 pounds of film that had to be shipped from wherever they were and all kinds of negotiations. So it was not easy, but I think at the end of the day, I was, uh, what, what, what I, I kept in my mind was that 
why are, why are these kinds of films not getting distributed in Canada? And interestingly enough, at that point, I think Quebec had a much more interesting, a much more vibrant industry, and and they 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 there were films that were sold for Quebec, uh, foreign films, uh, that were sold in for Quebec rights, but not but English Canadian rights were not sold, and they were retained by the sales companies, mainly because you know North America, the English speaking North America, was sold as one territory, and and if the U.S. distributors did not pick up a film. Uh, Canadian distributors did not make the, the the output deal and did not have them. So that was that was the thinking behind it. And I wasn't completely aware of that, but I think I I knew that there was a problem. And so when I finished a job that I was doing at the Ontario Arts Council, I said, well, "What am I going to do now?" And it was completely out of a whim in some ways, and I, out of naivete, really. I said, "Okay, fine. I'll 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 set up this company and we'll pick up some documentaries and short films and try to market them to universities and colleges." And that's how I started. And w did you find it uh, challenging, or were were doors opening in, in front of you? No, it was extremely challenging, of course. Uh, I mean, so the kinds of films that I was interested in, and, and the first collection of uh, shorts and uh, documentaries that I, I, I curated, uh, there are 12 films in that, and it was on race, culture, and identity. And so I had films, uh, you know, the combination of Canadian films, British films, American films, and, uh, and uh, the idea was that we'll try to, you know, get really nice uh, video covers, and this is VHS days, uh, video covers, and then try to market them to universities and uh, colleges and uh, libraries. Uh, but just around that time, and this is 1994, we had a government change in Ontario. Uh, Mike Harris uh, was the premier in Ontario, and there was like massive cutbacks in the education system. And so suddenly you're going out there to libraries and universities that don't have any money to buy your your video, which was like 95 bucks for, for a video. So, so it, you know, it quickly became apparent. In fact, I mean, what I found out was that what, what the schools were looking for, because of the cutbacks, there were less teachers and they were looking for stuff that they could just put it on the, on the video machine and walk out of the room for 20 minutes so that, you know, but it was all, you know, like self-explanatory kind of stuff. Uh, and this, the kind of stuff that I was do, uh, I, w I had on offer was nothing like that. I mean, it was more like a beginning of a conversation, or uh, you know, and it was not the, the whole package. So clearly, there was no not much of a market, and I found out very quickly that that was not where things were going to go. But the, but the interesting thing was that it was in '94, in, in September '94, at the Toronto Film Festival, that I, I saw a film called Silences of the Palace, and I just was like I had a bunch of tickets, and I went to see the film. And I was completely taken by the film, and I came out of the screening room, and I saw the sales agent outside, and I said, well, if nobody else distributes this film, I will, and not knowing what the hell I was talking about. I had no idea what that meant. But it was one of those moments where you think, like, oh, yeah, she, this, this feels good to say that. So I did say it, and, uh, and she says, no, no, it's okay. We are, you know, we are talking to Harvey Weinstein, and, you know, we'll, we'll, it'll get distributed. And uh, so, great, as long as it gets out, more people should see it. That was my only, only sort of, you know, uh, comment on that. So it was... A few months later, uh, following January, January 1995, I was at the Rotterdam Film Festival and I ran into Helen Loveridge. She was a sales agent for a company called Fortissimo Films. And she sees me and says, oh, if you still want that film, it's yours. And I said, really? It's like, okay. So we had a meeting and, and basically the deal was very simple. It was like, I, mean, I didn't have to pay, put any money for it. It was like, okay, you take the film uh, and you distribute the film and we'll share profits 50-50. You spend the money to release the film and then you know we'll see. And so I, I had no choice but to say, of course, hello. Uh, and 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 it was uh, it was a complete you know I mean I had to learn that, that business from scratch. So I had no idea what I was doing. I had to figure out. I had to make the contract up and you know the whole sort of terms and everything, and then take meetings with people like Michael Kennedy, who was at Cineplex, who still is at Cineplex, after all these years. And Michael Kennedy's comment he remembers it as well as I do, is that are you crazy? Like I don't even know this guy. I call him on the phone and I said, he says, are you nuts? Why, why are you getting in this business? Like okay, so, so I mean you know, and it took me like it was Im impossible to get a screen. I mean I would call him. In fact, we had a date in August of 1995. And he had given me the date. I started working on the film, getting promoted, promoting the film. And then three weeks before the date, he says, no, sorry, I, have to, uh, I can't give you the cinema because Alliance decided to release eight films that month. So I said, okay. And this was at the Carlton, which was the only art house cinema in Toronto at the time. And so after that, I had to call him every week on a Monday uh, and say, can I get a screen? No. Can I get a screen? So, so it took like almost... Uh, four months, and at a certain point I was like hoping that he would say no, because if he said yes, then I had to deal with the fact that I have to get this film out. So eventually, it, I did get the date, it was November 3rd, 1995, I had three weeks notice, um, and, and I you know, went crazy and promoted it, and luckily for me, it worked.
And it was one of those things where I was given one week and says, if it doesn't work, you're out. I was like, okay, fine. And, uh, and I didn't even go to the cinema because I was too afraid to check the numbers. Uh, and, uh, and then I went and it, it worked out. So we played for about eight weeks there. Amazing. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, yes, it deserves applause. In the interest of time, I have to fast forward to 2001 because that was a very big year for, for Mongrel. Yes. Can yes. you tell us about, there two things happened. Right, there. right. I mean, up till, up to, so from 95 on, I started re releasing films and, you know, like three, four, five films a year kind of a thing. And it was in, in, in 2001 that uh, we got involved with uh, our first Canadian film, Ed Script, and that was Bollywood Hollywood, Deepa Mehta's film which she just told me about this idea over lunch and you know, I liked the idea and so then let's do it and then three months later she had a script and you know we fast for, for I mean it was like it happened so quickly it was amazing how quickly it happened because it doesn't happen that quickly anyways in, in general. Uh, so in, in 2001 she started shooting that film and also that year was the first time we started dealing with Sony Classics. Uh, we uh, you know they were looking for a distributor, uh, a partner in Canada and I offered my services, and after a while, they you know decided to work with us, and uh, we started handling their films. So, uh, and both of them, you know, ended up becoming like really successful for us. In 2002, we went to the Toronto Film Festival with 16 films, including Bollywood Hollywood, and some great films that year. Uh, Bollywood Hollywood was released in 2002 and did about one and a half million dollars. At that time, it was probably the highest grossing English Canadian film, second highest grossing English Canadian film that year in, uh, in, uh, in Canada. And, uh, and with Sony, I mean, we ended up get, we're getting films like Capote and, uh, and uh, uh, um, I mean, every year we've got some amazing films through them. So, so th that changed the, 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 the dynamic for the company. And at that point, I moved out of my garage <laughs> to another office, which is where we are right now, at least for the last 10 years. And we'll be moving to another office next year. But so that was a big transition. You have 28 employees now. I do. So they would not fit in your bedroom. Uh, <laughs> or your basement. basement although exactly, I actually haven't been exactly, in your basement, exactly, so I don't exactly, know. Maybe exactly, they would. Exactly. Um, the uh, Sony Pictures uh, ha Classics had had other partners that had uh, not survived. W what do you think uh, Mongrel has been able to do to be successful, to have a successful business model? W is there some sort of um, guiding principle that you've been following? I think, I mean, you know, so, uh, I... I I've been given a lot of advice over the years, of course, and I've taken some and not others. But one of the things that I learned right from the beginning was to, you know, manage my overhead to the extent, uh, to very, very closely. So I think that has been one of the factors. I mean, we've, we've, you know, we are very frugal when it comes to managing our finances and stuff like that. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't do flashy things. Uh, so that has been one of the things. But the other thing was, I think, choosing the right films. I mean, it's one of those things where, of course, you know, I mean, you, you go with your personal taste in whatever you do, and I do that to, to a large extent. But more importantly, I also sort of kept keep in mind who the audience is for that film. So I think that that has been uh, one of the discipline that we have is that you know you have to try to not imagine, not just go by the fact that this is a great film, but who is that? Who's the audience for this film, and how will we get to that audience? So that is one 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 sort of you know uh, answer to your question. In terms of Sony Classics, yes, it's true. They they had been working with uh, with several companies. I think there were three companies that had, that they had partnered with and. All three companies either got sold or went bankrupt. In fact, the last company that went bankrupt was a company called Black Watch, and uh, they had come out of uh, a huge success with Crouching Tiger. Crouching Tiger did about fifteen million dollars in box office in Canada, and uh, four months later, the company went under. So that I mean, you know, that, but 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 the business has always been like this. I mean, in, in the twenty years, I have seen so many companies come and go, and or get sold or get merged, and then. Gone or whatever it is. I mean, it's a risky business in the sense that you are, you know, you you're investing all your money before the film opens, and you know, and and nobody really can predict how a film will do. I mean, there are all kinds of, you know, uh, advanced polls and stuff like that. People, the, the studios do. We don't do it for indep independent films, but it's it's very difficult to figure out. I mean, like there's so many factors that come into play. I mean, you know, where the uh, the review of the film. Uh, what are the films that are opening on a Friday? Where does your review get placed? Do you get a picture with it? Uh, uh, what is the weather like? Uh, you know, if it's a beautiful weather, like it has been in, in Vancouver this last summer, the box office drops immediately. You know that. And so if you don't start really strongly, 
it's very difficult to catch up. And you know, and the and the way the business works is in any given cinema, I mean, like if there's a fiveplex at at Fifth Avenue, uh, there's there, you know, every week they have to put new films in because they're films waiting to get in every week. And so the way it works is that if you are r ranking in the last two uh, uh, in, in, in the last two spots, you will go out. I mean, there's no there's no unless. Unless you do it so well and you make a big fight and you know you've managed to you know stay for another week, but if you are in the bottom two, you will go out. So if you end up you know opening on a bad weekend, and you end up in that slot, you're gone, and that's it. Basically, there's no move over. It's not like you can move from Fifth Avenue to International Village or somewhere else. I mean, that's it. So you know, and there's tremendous risk involved in that, uh, and uh, and it's not easy to uh, and and if you if you make too many mistakes, you could be out of business very quickly. So that's the, that's, I mean, so, so I mean, sometimes we are known to be very conservative in about how we go about it. We are very selective in terms of uh, films that we pick up. We are, uh, and, and I think those are the things that has uh, uh, helped us stay in business in all these years. You, you mentioned Crouching Tiger. We, we had some news, uh, I think it was this week, with Crouching yes. Tiger and Netflix. Mm -hmm. The landscape has changed. Mm -hmm. The distribution landscape has changed. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's unimaginable, I'm sure, from mm -hmm. 1994 to now, mm -hmm. the scenario that mm -hmm. you're working in. How do you keep ahead of the technological changes and the changes brought on by technology? And w what are you thinking of in terms of what's next? I mean, absolutely. This, it was this week only that uh, the Netflix announced that they will be premiering uh, *Crouching Tiger* two. It's it's uh, next uh, August twenty eighth, two thousand fifteen, which is pretty brilliant in some ways. I mean, it, it is something that is that that has been in the cards for a while. Netflix has announced a couple of years ago that they were in, going to get, get into film into into premiering films. Um, but and and the, the, I mean, the, yeah, the the, the 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 technological changes have been phenomenal in the last twenty years. Yet at the end of the day, you know, people are looking for stories, and there's always going to be a market for great stories. That's one thing that I believe in. Secondly, I do believe that people still like to see films in a social context. Um, they do have a lot more choices, of course. Uh, just the way we like to go and have a coffee at Starbucks or any other coffee shop, even though we can make a perfectly fine coffee at home. Uh, we still go out. And so I think the desire to go out, desire to see a film among strangers, uh, be seen in a, in a social context, will always be there. So I think that I'm not, I, I think that the, the, the uh, more, uh, you know, films will still, there'll be cinemas in, in the next 10 years. They may be programming differently, but they will still be around, that they, people will still go out. Uh, what we are seeing right now is, uh, you know, phenomenal number of films getting made uh, on any given weekend right now. Um, it, it doesn't happen so much in Vancouver probably or in Toronto for that matter. But in New York, I think there are about 20 to 30 films opening every week. So out of those 20, 30 films, and that's only in cinemas, you know, then there are a whole bunch of new films that go straight to VOD. So on Tuesday on iTunes if you or any of the VOD services that you're looking at, a lot more films will show up that you've not even heard about that were not released theatrically. So, I mean, you know, you're looking at a huge number of films that are going out and into circulation, and I mean, and, and, the, and the billions that get loaded up on YouTube. So, I mean, I don't know where people find the time or how people are navigating through this. And I think so. So, we are living in a world where there's so much out there, and 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 you know, you do get at least I do. There's a paralysis of choice. I mean, you go and look. I mean, when I go and get on Netflix and I see like you know, so many films there. And I think I'd like to see this, 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 this. And at the end of the day, I don't see any of them because I, I can't make up my mind. That might be my problem, but I think it's not entirely my problem. I think it's, it's, it's more. And, and that is why, I mean, you, know, we, we, you may remember that a few years ago, radio was supposed to be dead. Like, you know, we had so many choices and you know, the MP3s and all that stuff. And people, why would they listen to radio? But yet people, radio is back in, in fashion. People listen to radio and people advertise on radio and stuff like that. At the end of the day, people still also like to be told, not to be told, but to have created conditions under which they can, they don't have to make those choices all the time, that you know, somebody is curating for them. Somebody is, is you know, has gone through the trouble to see like you know, 50 films to find out that one film that will present, and then there is a, a trust that can, can get built between the brand and the, and the, and the consumer, and you can probably you know, make your way. So I think that that is the way of the future, that you know, the, you know, the people will want trusted curators or trusted brands that they can rely on. It's just you know, when you have kids and you have young kids, you know that 
the only brand you could trust, you know, with limitations, of course, is Disney. That, you know, if you want to show stuff to your kids and you don't want to worry about the, 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 if there's anything in there, you, you choose Disney and you think more or less it'll be safe. So I think that, I mean, what we'll see is that people will, you know, uh, they'll be curated sort of either, uh, you know, more Netflixes, like they'll be, they'll be uh, specialized SWOT uh, sites or VOD sites or whatever it is. So you don't have to go through like a million titles to find out that one, one title that you want to see that particular night. That's my sense. I don't know. Cutting through the clutter is uh, challenging in these times. We are going to open up the floor for a few minutes of questions in just a moment. So if you have a question, you can put your hand up and a volunteer will come around with a microphone. Um, but on Netflix, there has been major friction here in Canada between Netflix and the CRTC, the Canadian Radio Television Telecommunications Commission, at hearings looking at the future of TV. I think it's called they're called Let's, Let's Talk, Talk TV. TV. Um, these, this uh, conflict between Netflix and the CRTC, I mean, this has implications for the film business as well, no? Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's, 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 uh, it's for the whole industry, really. I mean, you know, uh, what the outcome of, of this, this negotiation, it's not, it's not a conflict, really. I mean, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's Netflix's position is that they're not regulated, they're not, they, they do not have to report to, Net, uh, to CRTC, which is completely, absolutely accurate position that they're taken. And CRTC is caught in this, in this dilemma where they did not regulate Netflix, and yet the impact of Netflix on the rest of the broadcasting uh, uh, landscape is so fundamental that they cannot ignore the impact of Netflix. Right, broadcasters who have to put money into Canadian Absolutely. productions. Absolutely. And so, it, 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 I mean, you know, uh, it, it, and this is not just in Canada. I think it'll, it'll be a global situation where how do... How uh, this new technological sort of force? How do you how do you find a way that you can allow for that to happen? It is happening already. It's not like you know you can go back, but how do you continue to create indigenous industries, and indigenous culture and indigenous sort of employment, and and you know because you have a situation with Netflix where. They, there's not a single employee of Netflix in Canada. So you do have a, a, a you know, they're working out of Los Gatos and, and Los Angeles is where the offices are. And, and they, you know, they've got three and a half, four million, that's the number that, uh, that is being stated right now in public sort of, uh, in, in newspapers, that they, that's the number of subscriptions that they have. That's, you know, more than all the pay TV subscriptions in Canada. So it has having a significant impact. And 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 and, the, and and you know the Canadian broadcasters they have made the argument and they will continue to make the argument is that they are they are required to spend a certain percentage of their revenues on original programming in Canada, uh, and which is not the case with Netflix. So I, I mean you know uh, the the, thing, the 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 logical sort of move forward would be either you regulate Netflix or you deregulate everybody else. Now if you deregulate everybody else then it opens up the whole issue of do we even protect our airwaves or do, does HBO and Showtime and everybody be allowed to, to be in Canada? If that happens, then, uh, then what happens to the indigenous players and the, 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 the billions of dollars that have been spent to build an infrastructure in Canada, uh, what happens to that? So, uh, you know, I mean, it is, it, is, it is not an easy, easy, easy solution to this uh, as to how we move forward, uh, but we also have to factor in that, you know, if we are going to be an independent country and we do have a sense of our own culture and our own stories and our own history, I mean, you know, uh, we have to find some way to protect that. Because otherwise, I mean, you know, as we know with uh, uh, Argo, was it Argo that, you know, the, the story about the Iranian, yeah. Yes. I mean, it was supposed to be a Canadian Mistold. story. It was supposed to be a Canadian story, but it becomes all Americanized. So, I mean, you know, we could, we could go that route. I mean, you know, if in, a, in a context where if we are not regulated, if there are no, no CanCon commitments uh, from broadcasters or Netflix or whoever it is in, the, in that arena, then, then you know the films will be get will get made out of the U.S. U.S. will have to sort of you know U.S. It'll be uh, U.S. Store, uh, all stories will be become U.S. stories really. That's one scenario. So yes, it will have a big impact. So happy news. Uh, does anybody <laughs> have a question? Do we have any questions? Yes, question over here. <clears throat> That's, I'm so glad you brought up that issue. Um, the CRTC has always been a little bit of a hybrid and an odd duck, and sometimes we like it and sometimes we don't, but your point is very well taken. Is it not possible for Canada to lead the charge to maybe 
pull back a little bit the absolute power on the internet based companies by saying if you wish to uh, have Netflix in Canada, we will charge Canadians an extra 25 cents. You must include X number of Canadian films in your product package and they must go to all the countries you go in. And then you negotiate the same with other countries and it becomes a world cinema. I mean, it could be pitched even as a very beautiful global thing. Am I dreaming? Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, the first issue is, you know, the, the, uh, have you seen, uh, uh, is it Eric Schmidt who was here yesterday in, in Toronto? I think there's a piece in the Globe today. Uh, he's the head of uh, uh, Google, the executive chairman of Google. And his argument is we don't want any, any controls whatsoever. I mean, you know, that they, the, the idea is that this is the internet and this is the new way and there should not be any controls. Yet it was when it was pointed out that, you know, China is, is con absolutely controlling Google and they, they admit to that. So, you know, the fact is that, the, 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 you know, if you go by, the, by Silicon Valley's sort of expectations and their desire is not to have any controls whatsoever, Yet the fact is that if you let that uncontrolled, then whatever hap what happens to the existing industries? I mean, the, the argument is that, oh, they will adjust to it. But I mean, the question is, at what cost? And, and where, does, where, do, where does a political system and, a, and political independence come into play? You know, if, if you let corporations basically decide how we live, then, uh, uh, then what's the point in having a democratic system? So... You know, I mean, but, but we all use Google. We all use, uh, you know, all kinds of internet. Uh, uh, I mean, internet has changed our world. So it's not like it's just for the for the for the elites. But but the fact is that there is an economy behind that that has to be that has to be. You know, I mean, of course, you know, we, nobody can stop the advance of technology. We have not done that. We don't want to do it. We want to. We we are all are all all our lives are getting enriched by by the fact that we have so much access to, uh, access to so much information. So I'm I'm not against it at all. I think that we need to find some kind of a balance and this is always happens with any new technology I mean the technology will emerge nobody expects that this is going to be taking over I mean five years ago eight years seven years ago I mean, nobody was afraid of Netflix I mean Netflix was a video distribution company with sending you you know uh, little DVDs on in, in, in a red envelope uh, so so but the fact is that now it, it's become a, 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 a phenomenal force and so there'll be opposition and then there'll be competition and then there'll be some kind of adjustment. So I think that we are in that process of adjusting to the new realities. And those new realities are not even completely out there. I think it'll take a few, um, many more years before it all settles down. But I think that, you know, uh, for, for our government to claim, like, you know, as I think uh, 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 Shelley Glover and, uh, um, uh, and Pr uh, Prime Minister Harper have been sort of tweet tweeting or whatever it is saying that we will not, we will not regulate internet. Uh, I think it's a mistake um, because I mean I was thinking that if if for instance if Netflix was owned by Chinese uh, by by a Chinese company, I'm I I I would imagine that the gov government of Canada would want to regulate that, given that they have taken positions on different sort of you know other investments from China at different times on national security grounds. So I mean I think it's 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 a, 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 the idea that if uh, for that. That, that, that there should not be any political intervention is a mistake. I think that there will have to be political intervention at a certain point. It's just the nature of that. I think that, you know, what Netflix is providing, I mean, we are major suppliers of Netflix. I mean, we, and that for us, Netflix has been a real lifesaver, really. I mean, for our business, we were able to put m most of our films on Netflix and they're available and we're thrilled and, and they're fantastic people to work with. So absolutely all the good things about them and and the technology is phenomenal. I mean, the fact that you, you know, on this phone right now, you have access to thousands of films that you would have never been able to do before. So, I mean, there's no, there, there's not a doubt in my mind that this is all very good. It's just that we also need to find ways, that the existing structure that we have, we need to find a way to adjust for that because we, we can't just let our entire industry to go away just because there's a new technology. Do I have time for another question? One more. One more. Does anyone else have a question? No? Okay, I do. Um, boyhood, yes. how did you manage to secure that film? Uh, that 
That's I mean, a big one for Boyhood you guys. Boyhood is a fantastic film. I mean, it's an amazing film. And and we had done uh, the last Richard Linklater film, uh, so and we did very well with it uh, before midnight. Uh, so I had I met him and you know he told me about this film, uh, but at that point I didn't I didn't pay any attention to it except for like it sounds like an amazing project. Uh, it was financed in a very interesting way. I mean, of course, it's it's one of those films that like you know I mean so somebody said yes and then had to sort of defend it for many years because it was IFC, uh, Jonathan Sering, who, uh, whose company said yes to this project. And they were putting money in every year. I think they were putting about $200,000 every year. And he was shooting every year for the last 12 years. So the film did not cost a huge amount of money. I think it's probably about three, three and a half million dollars is probably the, right, well, the number that might have ended it. And, and uh, it, it premiered at, uh, at Sundance early this year. Then it was shown right after. And I had a couple of people in, uh, from my office who'd seen the film in, at Sundance, loved it. And I saw it in, in Berlin uh, at a private screening. And I was completely taken by it. Uh, so after that, it was a question of like, you know, trying to secure the rights. I mean, there were some studios that were interested in the film. Uh, in fact, Universal picked up uh, most of the world rights. And there was a moment when they were thinking, oh, should they go through a studio? I mean, all the big studios were interested in buying the film. Uh, and luckily for me, they decided, no, they would not go that route, that they'll go through the independent distribution route. And so in the US, it was IFC, and the Canadian rights were available. And so we had to negotiate, and I had to beg and you know, pay whatever they wanted, and you know, manage to get the film. I mean, it was later that they said, oh, they were going to work with me anyway. So I didn't, uh, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the stuff that I had to go through was unnecessary in any event. Um, no, we were thrilled to have that film. And it's, it's one of my favorite films of all time, really. It's a, if, if you have not seen that film, I would urge you to go see that film because it is a, it is a life-changing film. Released in July, still in theater is amazing. You don't, you don't get to say that very often. No, that's true. Uh, Hussein Amarshi, I can see why Tom Bernard, who's the co-president of Sony Pictures Classics, calls you the Wayne Gretzky of <laughs> Canadian distribution. <laughs> sort of an outdated uh, yes. reference, yes. but you know, we all, <laughs> even Americans know about Wayne Gretzky and ho hockey. Thank you so much. Congratulations on 20 years, and here's to many, many more. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank Pleasure. you.